I see. It got broken into so many pieces that you couldn't fix it. But it's strange. As far as I can tell, you possess the ability very much like my own. If so, you should be able to restore these broken pieces with ease. Now that Sabaki's fixed, you should be able to join the battle line. But I would advise you not to. Do you still want to fight? Yes, I want to fight. Then you shall. There is a way for you to fight, but you must find it. Please remember this. The important thing isn't how you should be, but how you want to be. Everything about this scene struck out to me, from panelling, interactions and subtle undertones, given primarily from Tsubaki and Hachi. Making this video is incredibly tough for me as wanting to talk about her character development and explanation of her powers go one in the same. People to this day are confused about what her powers do and what they are, so chances are I'll have to make this a two part special as there's a lot of detail to delve into. But let's deep dive today in explaining in the best way Orihimaru's powers. But before we get into that, this video has been brought to you by Tokyo Tree. Tokyo Tree is a Japanese monthly snack subscription box that contains 20 of the latest, most exclusive, limited edition and seasonal flavored Japanese snacks that are only available in, of course, if you didn't guess it, Japan. These treats can consist of such things such as different varieties of Pepsis and Kit Kats along with many more. In this case, we get an awesome caramel popcorn soda, which is actually really refreshing, and pudding Kit Kats, which is arguably one of my favorite from the boxes thus far. With your new box, Tokyo Treat comes with a new theme every month, keeping things exciting and fresh every single time. For example, this month's theme is Snacking Shibuya. And if the name didn't give it away, it gives you the most popular snacks Shibuya has to offer. Their mission is to simply share Japanese culture to the world. So if you want to enjoy or would like to enjoy some pop culture Japanese snacks, you can definitely count on Tokyo Tree as your go-to service. Are you worried of not knowing what snack is in the box itself? Don't worry, because they provide a booklet that lets you know what every snack is, and plus, there's a lot of information that you could learn about Japanese culture in general. Me personally, I've been really enjoying the ramen that they have to offer in this edition, as well as the Fuji or all sorts. So, what are you waiting for? Give it a try. Live a little. Tokyo Tree is a service that I generally highly recommend and that I use personally. So be sure to use my code JAMESH to get $5 off your first Tokyo Tree box. That's James H to get $5 of discount. And thanks again for Tokyo Treat for sponsoring today's video. But let's get back into it. Orihime's power, Shun Shun Rika, has multiple abilities to its name, being healing, shielding, and attacking in its simplest form. If only it stayed that way, because of course in Kubo fashion, things have to get a little bit complicated. The reason why it's complicated is because many characters have had their theories or just outright refused to tell the audience, like Kisuke, Hachi or Yoruichi. Okiura had his theories but Aizen believed it was the ability to reject phenomena, and viewers and the community hold true to this explanation alike. I mean, when the baddest and smartest anime antagonist says something is, you kind of don't want to disagree with him. However, we also know that while Aizen might be on the nose with this, there's still a lot of context we do not know. And that poses a problem. We will break down Orihime's abilities and feats, and towards the end, I will allude to some questions and thoughts regarding these missing links. So, make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already for more deep dives. Orihime's ability stems from her hairpins, hairpins that her brother Sora gave to her as a gift. These were however not worn as she believed that these were a childish accessory. Until Sora unfortunately died due to a car accident. Now, while telling you this information is very basic, I believe that this may seem vital information throughout the video. When Orihime awakened her abilities, she gave birth to Sun Sun Rika, six spirits in the form of fairies, even though they claim that they aren't fairies that, as far as we know, are responsible for a variety of functions. Shuno and Ayame cover healing, rejecting destruction from behind the shield, meaning reversing anything within it. Biogon, Hinagiku and Lily cover shielding and defense, rejecting destruction from beyond the shield, while Sabaki alone covers offense on his own, rejecting from both sides of the shield and rejecting whatever it hits effectively, as well as being the weakest spirit she can summon. Or is he? I feel the term reverse and destruction is somewhat of a half-truth, however. Not to say the translation is inherently wrong, but the kanji used was hakai, meaning destruction or disruption. I often thought to myself, what's destructive about damage? Or even reversing the ceiling on something like the Hogyoku, 
something that Aizen originally planned to use Orihime for. What counts as destructive? It makes sense for an attack, it's something offensive that creates an impact. Likewise with Sabaki, I always imagined he's creating something destructive to reject in the first place, creating an implosion of sorts. But I think disruption can explain a lot of these elements too. Disruption of the body, disruption of space, disruption of something that shouldn't in fact be. So rejecting phenomena which Aizen stated is really not that far-fetched in context. So how strong can Orihime be? Orihime can be as strong as she needs to be. While this is a vague answer I know, let me explain. Orihime's abilities rely purely on her mindset and determination. Remember, the start of the video where Hachi tells Orihime, the important thing isn't how you should be, but how you want to be. You can notice this when Orihime isn't supposed to fight in the Soul Society arc by Uryu. Sabaki also alludes to this by telling Orihime that she throws like a goal. S Sabaki, I don't know if you noticed this, but, but she is. Regardless of that meme, Jirobo solidifies Sabaki by stating that there is no murderous intent. Even stating after Uryu defeated Jirobo that she doesn't feel stronger and that she self-doubts. Because she feels like she's not on the same level as her contemporaries. This theme repeats following the Aranka arc where Kisuke tells Orihime not to get involved in the Battle of Aizen. Because of these constant affirmations, she's unable to heal Sabaki. Because Sabaki is used for attacking. Something she believes she won't even be doing. Orihime's strongest asset at this point has been healing and defending. Because as Uryu stated, that is in her nature to protect. And we have some great feats with this. Healing Tatsuki, healing Chad, healing Grimjow's amputated arm, completely recovering half the body of Melanie, and blocking an attack from Orkira with each time her mentality increases in this aspect. Going from failing to block Yami's finger to Orkira's blade is a tremendous amp in her headspace. But in Kubo fashion, we have to also take away that mentality and reinforce it. The moment Ichigo gets shot in the chest by Orkira, Orihime's brain breaks and is unable to keep composed and the sheer dread and anguish in her paneling shows she's lost everything. Kubo makes it known to show to us this mental blockage by demonstrating Orihime telling herself that she was blinded by her own fantasy that everything would be alright. She fooled herself that much that when that painted picture she made for herself crumbled, she was incapable to contemplate how to even function. She was living on full copium and delusion. Topped with seeing Uryu fighting on the brink of death, the trauma caused her shield to break like glass, showing no resistance or stability, and trying to heal Ichigo was the equivalent of putting on a band-aid. However, going back to destruction and distortion, it could also be the fact that Orihime's healing was also fighting with Hollow Ichigo's Reishi too, and seeing how Hollow Ichigo is part of Ichigo, there wouldn't technically be any distortion or destruction to technically repair. Well James, what about when Orihime healed his hole before, when Orkiora fisted him? Well, well, Orihime did state that there was a tremendous spiritual energy swirling within him, which again follows the same law that Hollow Ichigo had influence, and rejecting destruction or distortion is redundant as that is Ichigo's spiritual energy in the first place. You may even question why healing Melanie's body and recovering Grimjell's arm worked. It was a simple fact of what Hachi said. The important thing isn't how you should be, but how you want to be. You could say she believed that this is how she should do things in order to survive, but I feel at this moment, she wanted to do this. Remember, Orihime chose to go with Okiora. She wasn't forced, as debatable as that may seem. But she was given a choice regardless. She believed that what she was doing was the correct way of doing things and clearly had motivations for her actions. To even being in Aizen's presence, she showed the composure. Orihime naturally has gotten stronger as time has gone by. I believe the Fullbring arc really brought out Orihime's strength and allowed her to really understand Hachi's quote. Ichigo lost his powers. She had no one to rely on but herself and turned that perspective mindset into strength to protect Ichigo from adversaries, as beautifully shown as she defends Ichigo from Ginjo with not only a shield but a counterattack from Sabaki to follow. When Ichigo says he's ready to keep training with Ginjo, Orihime tells Ichigo to wait in a demanding way. Then, when Ginjo attacks, she stands that ground. She was the boss of that altercation. Her way was the only way, and what she said don't attack until I say so, literally meant it. Orihime at that moment showed that there are finally more ways to protect than just shielding. That you can in fact protect and defend 
by attacking too. Touching briefly on the Thousand Year Blood War arc, Orihime's development for her powers and abilities are more so showcased in full. Orihime is shown to block attacks from UR Buck and even shown some great reaction speeds. Remember, Ichigo has been able to casually dodge point blank gunshots from Robert and this is important as Orihime has blocked attacks that Ichigo hasn't been quick enough to dodge from you watch. However, later on, Ichigo begins to get more serious. Orihime isn't quick enough to activate a shield as Ichigo charges in due to anger, which is expected from our main character. However, there are two instances I primarily would like to talk about, one of which being Orihime failing to heal the Spirit King after he'd been severed in two by Ichigo. Orihime's healing ability shattered before he even got the chance to form, so I want to give my theory towards this. Your Buck states that a human power would never be able to revive the Spirit King, which isn't too far-fetched. The moment the Spirit King's vessel was severed was the moment that the concept or law regarding how Rieishi abides also crumbles. The fabric of life and death becomes unstable and thus the same with rejecting something which in theory does not particularly exist. Law and order became non-existent. Which brings me to Orihime being unable to restore Ichigo's Zanpakuto. Orihime was unable to achieve this because Yuabak removed any future, past or present where it was unable to be restored. Hence, why she was only able to restore it after Tsukushima forcibly created a new reality of which it was made possible. So, why is Orihime seen in the community as useless? In reality, most support characters are overlooked. Orihime is the definition of femininity. She's human and a dreamer. For half the series, she never took the fighter role and accepted what was told of her. While she wasn't useless by any stretch of the imagination, people took her actions as stupid or the stereotypical damsel in distress. Not taking a moment to see that everything she does is by choice and emotional. One would say, realistic. She cares way too much, and when you have an ability based from an emotional mindset, you will see many flaws within her character and power. But that's the point. You're supposed to see her flaws, because the development later on becomes such an appreciative journey. People like Rukia. Sure, let's compare a female character who has had 150 years of military fighting and energy control compared to a girl who has had to live in a world of abnormalities and fighting for two years plus. I think people like to compare way too much instead of understanding why they are written the way that they are. And personally, Orihime is written wholesomely, and I haven't even deep dived into character development alone. Is Orihime a fallbringer? In Bleach Can't Fear Your Own World Volume 3, it states that Orihime and Chad are in fact fallbringers. This most, if not indefinitely, happened because of Ichigo's inability to control his spiritual energy very early on in the series. As stated by Shinji to back this up, that Ichigo's spiritual energy could be felt from across the world. Because Ichigo has hollow Rieishi inside of him, it has been able to influence those around him, giving people like Tatsuki, Keigo, and Mizuru the ability to see the supernatural. This would make sense as to why Orihime and Chad don't fit the normal circumstances of how Fallbringers get their abilities in the first place. However, and hear me out here, how cool would it have been to have a callback when Sora bit into Orihime in soul form specifically that he transferred some of that hollow Rieishi into her, much like with what happened with Masaki when White bit her. But it would also be cool as well because much like how Masaki embedded power into a charm that she gave to Ishin to then later give to Ichigo, it'd be cool if something similar happened with Sora and the hairpins. Just, just little thoughts, you know? In conclusion, I feel the community has made Orihime's power and abilities more complicated than they needed to be. Rereading Orihime's highlights of the series has definitely been enjoyable and I've been able to pay more attention to details such as current emotional and mental cues. If I had to pinpoint where in the series the disrespect for Orihime came from was from the Ichigo and Okiora fight where in the anime, Orihime is seen consistently saying Kurosaki-kun. While this is dramatic in the anime, in the manga, it's just really not that excessive and shows how literal humans act in the state of shock, especially to someone that they know that die. Watch any movie watch actual people at funerals. People seem to have a distaste for this which boggles me, but 
again to each their own I guess. I did always have thoughts about Hachi and Orihime's abilities being similar too, so I'll throw a little theory in there just to get you guys thinking. Now I know Orihime's spirits told her that they weren't, in quotations, fairies, but what if they were based from the fairies from the fairy realm that Kubo told us exists? And that's where Hachi learned how to create this new form of Kido. We are aware that Soul Reapers are aware of other realms like the Beast Realm and the West Branch Soul Society, so I wouldn't say it's too far-fetched. Maybe that's why Hachi was really intrigued because he knew something maybe not many people knew. So I think that's a perfect way to end today's video. Tell me your guys' thoughts of course in the comment section down below. With that being said, I'm gonna catch you guys later. You guys of course have this fine day, being handsome and as always people, peace out.